or is it just the panelists? I, I think we're going to use the Q and A function today. So um, the chat should be for just the panelists. For the participants, please please use the, the Q and A, and then it helps us to manage what I hope is many questions we get as we stimulate your interest in building partnerships for the rubber value chain. I think it's three minutes past the hour and I think we've got more than more than half of our, our targets are already here. So should I begin, Sean or anyone else? have any issues otherwise nope. i think the tech is fine on the spotlights here um the cursor can be seen um i think okay. we're good okay well i'll um maybe stay on the first slide just for a moment so we can introduce the speakers that you're going to hear from old uh, you can see a picture of my my younger brother um, second from there, my name's Richard Laity. I'm sitting in Phuket. I've been working in the Asia Pacific in forestry for more than 15 years. And my job with PFC is to develop national certification systems and to develop group certification systems that can include smallholders through forest management certification and chain of custody, which we're really going to focus on today. So. Um, that's myself. I'll be handing over to Siti soon, um, who will give a, a quick introduction for a few minutes. And then I will uh, do a, a bit of a case study on controlled sources that we've used in some countries in Southeast Asia. And then Sean will, will um, look at how cooperation can be done between a and a large uh, multinational company and, and the very small farmers from Indonesia. And then Akarin uh, from the Thailand Forest Certification Council um, and also a very experienced um, certification manager from a sawmill perspective. will be giving a case study on Thailand and the certified supply chain in Thailand. So that's... Uh, introduction and so i'd like to hand it over to city to just give a couple of welcoming remarks and thank you all for coming thank you richard hello everyone konnichiwa i i noticed that we have a number of uh, participants from japan and for those who are still celebrating eat mubarak and uh, my name is Siti Shaliza Mustafa, Deputy Secretary General and Chief Operating Officer of PEFC. Welcome to the PEFC webinar on SDG 17, Partnerships for the Rubber Value Chain. For those of you who are new to PEFC, we are the program for the endorsement of forest certification, an international not-for-profit organization dedicated to promoting sustainable forest management through independent third-party certification. PEFC is an international standard setting umbrella organization that provides independent assessment, endorsement, and recognition of national forest certification systems. We are present in 55 countries globally. It is estimated that um, nearly three quarters of all certified forests uh, globally are certified to PEFC and one third of all chain of custody globally have achieved PEFC certification for chain of custody. With more, with more than 24 years of experience, PFC today is the largest forest certification system in the world and continues to be the system of choice for, for smallholders. Ladies and gentlemen, at the Rio Plus 20 conference in 2012, the UN member states decided to develop global goals for sustainable development. The SDGs are also called the Agenda 2030. It is a highly complex policy framework the 17 objectives linked therein are as ambitious as they are different, and they are challenging for all states who have to implement them. 
distinguished participants. Sustainability topics are not new to the forest sector. In fact, the first definition of sustainable development was related to forestry. The forest sector itself can be grouped to SDG 15, life on land. Um, target 15.2 in particular states by 2020, promote the implementation of sustainable management of all types of forests, halt deforestation, restore degraded forest, and substantially increase afforestation and reforestation globally. I think we can um, have this next slide, please. SDG 715 is directly related to other SDGs, such as uh, SDG 13 on climate change, um, SDG 2 on zero hunger, SDG 6 clean water and sanitation, SDG 8 on decent work and economic growth, SDG 10 reduce inequalities, and it is also linked with SDG 12 on responsible consumption and production. Balancing environmentally related SDGs like SDG 15 with other human-centered SDGs, coherent policies are needed across different SDGs and sectors. The direct outputs of the forest sector, such as timber production, manufacturing of forest products, and tourism can support the achievement of several SDGs. Well-managed forests can have a positive impact on biodiversity, create income to fight poverty, provide medicinal plants, fresh water for drinking and irrigation, and provide capture and storage of carbon, amongst others. As relations between SDG strategies are complex, the SDGs call for integrated and sustainable land use management. The good news is that forest certification is recognized as an instrument to improve sustainability practices in the forest sector as it provides the framework and tool to navigate these different objectives in a more practical manner. Over the next one and a half hour, we will be exploring with you the role of BEFC towards achieving sustainable development goals, SDG, meeting the commitments under the Environmental Social Governance, ESG, and the support that we can provide and have been providing for the natural rubber sector in meeting all these different goals and commitments. Next slide, please. Finally, we will open the floor for Q&A session and participants are invited to submit your questions and comments during the presentations. We also, welcome, we also welcome closer collaboration with interested stakeholders in supporting sustainable management and production of natural rubber. Before I pass over the screen to Richard, I wish to note that there is also a high, high interest from many of you on the requirements of the European Union's Deforestation Regulation or EDR. Please be informed that we have conducted an introductory webinar on the EUDR and the recording of the webinar is available on YouTube. Thank you. Over to you, Richard. You're muted, Richard. Richard. Oh, I was just uh, saying thank you to you, City, and uh, sorry that I'm. I have one video and one. Um, record one uh, voice recording because my internet's had a few problems. I was just saying thank you, Sidi. Um, uh, you've been working formally as the Deputy Secret uh, Secretary General of DFC International for about a month, but you've had more than 10 years experience in Malaysia, which has been one of the, the um, leaders in, in, in rubber and is continuing to be a, a big uh, hub. So lots of experience uh, that we now have in PFC International. So I am going to talk to you a little bit about um, some market production and consumption of certified products and um, how PFC works. And so I will first give you a, a bit of some more figures that City had, had already mentioned about um, uh, 330 million hectares that we have certified. However, with FSC, we um, have about 30%, 28% of the world's roundhog production. So there is, um, there, there, there's still a lot more forest to get certified. And that's why PFC is working very hard in working 
in the, the region. And one of the key sectors for Southeast Asia is rubber. And so uh, although we were once the pan-European forest certification and you can see Europe is covered in dark green, that's our original members that have a fully endorsed system. We have also grown to North America, to uh, most of the um, large Asian countries. And this means we now represent the major producing and consuming countries. We have some countries like Myanmar that are members, but not yet endorsed. And we also have some countries, which I'll share you about um, that are developing their systems, those ones in yellow, uh, such as Laos and Cambodia, which have uh, more than, I think I, I would say almost a million hectares between. So that is where we are. Now we will talk um, about how much rubber is certified as of this um, quarter. And so we have our mass, our, our avatar, this lay, our lay, the lady here giving, shedding light on what is the um, PFC material that's available. So for you rubber experts out there, you know about the different um, quality. So a lot of very, I think it's the best in the world quality um, products coming from Vietnam, where we have 115,000 hectares certified and the potential to produce almost 200,000 tons per hectare, uh, sorry, 200,000 tons per year in Vietnam. In Thailand, we're working with smallholders and building up slowly to, with the uh, Rubber Authority of Thailand and the cooperatives and um, have the first uh, group certification certificates in, in Thailand. In, and then in Indonesia, where you're going to hear about Sean's um, case study, we plan to have around 5,000 hectares certified because we, are, um, we have, have quite a, a few projects. So that's certified natural rubber, I call it. And I'm a forester, so please excuse me if I am oversimplifying it by calling it natural rubber, but it includes latex, specialty latex and so on. But the, here you can see there's a large quantity of the world's best quality and a continuity of supply of available PFC certified natural rubber. Moving down, is the rubber wood. And we've chosen three countries to focus on there. Vietnam can produce um, 300,000 cubic meters per year. Uh, in, in Malaysia, they have planted, but they are not yet mature, uh, 18,000 hectares. And in Thailand, they have their smallholder group that can produce some, um, uh, some, some uh, hundreds of thousands of hectares within the, the overall group. Um, so that's the, um, that is the um, certified, that means the forest is certified. You'll learn more about what that means. Um, now the last row is controlled source. And we both have controlled sources, both natural rubber and rubber wood. And we have some examples from Cambodia and Laos where we have 26,000 hectares, which can estimate more, more than 30, no, almost 40,000 tons. Um, so that's an overview of what rubber is available with PFC certification. And this, how did we get this rubber certified? We have been working um, with the logo on the bottom left is uh, the PFC uh, forestry and trade for ASEAN development, something I've been working on since 2016. In the last couple of years, we have worked with Norwegian funding with the UN Red project. And so this has meant that we have supported sustainable forest trade in the Lower Mekong region. You can see our conference from November last year. And this has enabled us to um, innovate 
and um, get greater ownership at the national level of certification so that it can be made available for um, uh, harmonized trade and um, ASEAN uh, development. Next, thanks. We have been recognized. Um, PFC often gets compared to other certification systems. And in the recent report from ASEAN RAI on responsible uh, investment in agriculture, PFC um, scored the highest at 95% because we work with our bottom up approach. And I'll show you, I'll, I'll tell you what that means later on. It means a, that we can work with intergovernmental processes and this enables us to be integrated into uh, market, in, market um, integration uh, commitments from, or from uh, regions like ASIM. So this is um, the, the regional assessment. And sorry, please, Sean, we can move to the next. Um, we, we have to remember that we're not just talking about cubic meters and how many uh, points we get in, in scores from, from different certification ratings. We're actually talking about all these different natural resources and livelihoods that depend on sustainable forest management, like Citi said. And um, these variety of ecosystem services or socioeconomic services, they all prosper under sustainable forest management. And a mechanism to demonstrate sustainable forest management is PFC. So we can look after these elements. So we go back to the cycle of a rubber plantation on the bottom left. And we talk about natural rubber growing. And we think of our rubber farmer, Miss Ari, who plants and has to wait seven years to get some, uh, to do tending with no income until the latex uh, can be uh, produced. And then that goes until about 25 years, sometimes up to 30. And then the trees are ch changed from being used for tapping to the production of wood. And then the cycle starts again. And this is a great green carbon um, uh, commodity. It's, it contributes to mitigating carbon by its use and using green carbon instead of black carbon. It's also a renewable product that can biodegrade and reduce pollution. And lastly is rubber, which is 85% of the world's, uh, sorry, of the rubber estates, 85% of it comes from smallholders. So it is a way to get money into poor people's pockets and get their kids to school. And so we are very happy to be working in the rubber sector and we are very happy that we can be used as a tool to continue this use of this green material. So what, what does it mean really when we look at the big picture the world is facing a lot of challenges and city already chose a couple that we will focus on with and what we aim to do today is we want to build partnerships between stakeholders and we work in sdg number 15 so our pfc forest values which is the, the elements of sustainability which come from our standards they are recognized in the indicators I'll show of the SDG life on land. And so this diagram shows that the life of land is the foundation and part of the biosphere that can then enable society and economies to be able to reach their other development goals. So this is where, where we are working and it's 
it's great that, that you can use forest certification to make a direct connection to your contribution to the sustainable development goal. Like I mentioned, the indicator 15.2.1, they recognize PFC and one other certification system um, as a way to measure our progress towards sustainable forest management. And so I, having certified rubber, PFC is safeguarding the world's forests and it is, it is, uh, PFC has been selected as an official indicator for this target. So we can show how we fit into the bigger, uh, bigger um, issues that are, our globe is, is, is facing. And there's, there's a range of drivers, regulations, re reporting frameworks and, and goals. Um, where, where are we? Where is PFC? PFC is, is here, a certification system that is based on ISO. And this and is um, what City talked about, a third party certification system. So when, I, when we talk about a third party certification system, we, we talk about three independent organizations. Um, we can start from the bottom right because most people know certification when they get their certificate from their certification body. Here are some example certification bodies. PFC has more than 30 that can issue chain of custody certificates globally. In countries like Vietnam, we have four that can issue the forest management one. And then the other part of the accredited, third party accredited um, system is the national standards on the top. And that's run by our members, like the Thailand Forest Certification Council, who you'll hear from later, uh, as well as Vietnam or Malaysia and Indonesia. You can see their logos there. They use at the national level and they have national systems that they run. And then the, the last pillar of the national certification system that delivers the certificates is the accreditation body. So they're the people who audit the auditors and they are all based on ISO processes. So I, ISO and the, um, the, the organization that runs it has more than 30,000 standards. And so we, we are using a system that um, is, is very well tried and one that is able to be run at, by local people for the local conditions. And then for international recognition, that's the map I, we showed with the green countries, the members like uh, TFCC, they become a member of PFC and we give them an endorsement so that they can use our logo to trade internationally. And then the other internationally, international recognized component of our system, we call this quality infrastructure, is, is the membership of the International Accreditation Forum that run the, the, the tens of thousands of standards around the world. So that's how certificates are delivered. Um, and there's a lot of technical frame, a lot of technical framework behind us, but that means that it's independent, unbiased, and it is appropriate. And this is especially important in unique production systems like smallholder rubber farmers. So that's what we call international third party accredited certification system. So now we have a poll and I'm not sure if it's gonna pop up or we're going to use this in the city's last um, slide. City mentioned the process of continuous improvement and PFC can be used for the value chain to um, validate or to mitigate risks. However, PFC, having PFC in your company can also help to deliver for your environmental and social governance. And that's what this question is about. And we, I wonder about 
the participants here um, will give another 20 seconds. So you have one minute. Which of the of the um, ESG rating metrics are most important? And this is this shows that there is a, a trend globally that the governments and the customers they expect they expect that there is responsible production in their supply chain. So we can close that poll and we can look at what are the major um, metrics that you use. And I can see that there's actually an even um, leader, two leaders, sorry, even leadership between the Global Reporting Initiative and the International Organization of Standardization. So that's ISO. That's, that's very interesting because ISO is what PFC is based on. And if you already know about ISO, then you, you know how to move forward with PFC. It's, a, it's the same infrastructure. Uh, the other um, ESG ratings, such as Ecovadas, they are important up with, I think, 33%. And so um, it's, it's, there's a lot of opportunities to use PFC in your ESG um, commitments. Okay, so we might now move into the um, other people's assessment of PFC. And here we use the Dutch government's TPAC, and they found that PFC is conforming to their requirements for procurement. So if you would like to sell any wood to the Dutch government, you have to have it certified. And they, they have their assessment committee that checks that the certification is robust, uh, credible, and that's why a PFC there gets full score. And so this um, is, is very good news that PFC International with 330 million hectares in 55 countries, we are seeing that there is a compliance through our bottom-up approach. So it's a proven approach to risk mitigation. And that is recognized through a lot more of these regulatory and other assessments that you can see here, like the Japanese Clean Wood Act, uh, or where they're, for example, in biomass, they may, you may need to have a certification to get a subsidy, or even just to um, be able to sell to the government, you need to be able to have certification. So these are the accepted. So how do we do it? We have our two port standards. The first one you can see there on the left is the start of the plantation. Ms. Ari is planting in the, and the sustainable forest management standard is the one that covers the, the forest management units, the, the production. However, we, the other core standard is our chain of custody. And the chain of custody links from links from the forest to the factory or from the factory to the consumer. And these are our main standards. However, we have additional standards which are required such as group certification. So the group certification is one additional standard. And here you can meet Miss Ari. She is part of our group certification in Trang province in, in Thailand. And that enables um, certification to be done at a landscape level where we can share resources and responsibilities because certification can be quite um, challenging if it's done um, at a small scale without many resources. So we work a lot on group certification and that's how we've grown through the Forest Owners Associations, et cetera, that have, can hold one certificate. And maybe 
of the certification requirements can be met at the landscape level. And then the other 5% is done at the farmer or harvesting level. So that's um, the inclusive approach of PFC group certification. So that's um, how PFC um, uh, takes up the market and how PFC um, is, is accepted by the market and also how we actually work. We've got some technical insight um, and I look forward to answering any, any questions later. So moving into the case study, I'd like to take you straight to what people thought might be impossible was how could we work in high risk countries like Cambodia um, and the, there is not yet a PFC member, but we can do, we can use our chain of custody. So we'll move on to see that in our trainings at the end of our last two year project in Cambodia, we have had a decision from the minister to establish the Cambodian forest certification system. And we also have private sector that are using the chain of custody and there is um, some 16,000 hectares with two companies certified. Uh, some of them are in the rubber sector and we also have others in the fast growing trees like the acacia. And so th this is um, our meeting from of the Cambodian stakeholders. And then we have a similar group from the um, one stakeholder, I forgot to say, say for Cambodia is the government. Of course, we involve the government. And here in Thailand, here in um, Laos, we have quite a large um, delegation from the government, and they are going to be critical as they are setting their standards and they are supporting uh, companies to implement chain of custody so that they can access the markets that require um, such claims. So this is. Um, improving the readiness for controlled source. Now, I'd like to take you for a walk down the rubber supply chain. And I'd like to start with the forest end. And there's two types of plantations we can think of. Those that are certified and that they are tracked through the certified processor and through the tapping, processing, manufacturing, and making a range of end products, and that they can then use the logo on the product to communicate to the customer. However, there is a second process that's going on here where there is this work in progress, or what we call our controlled sourcing. And that is where the orange arrows show that the certified processor goes and takes their micro their magnifying glass called a risk assessment and, and begins their due diligence. And they can look at, ver at verified rubber plantations and include them into the certified process and mix them with certified material. And that could be um, a small amount Sometimes the big companies are certified, but the small holders around it can only be controlled source. Uh, however, uh, if it's less than 30% of the finished product, you can use the logo on the top right-hand side on the product. But if there's not um, a lot of certified material available, however, you need a strong claim, you can use this orange surrounded label um, as an off product claim. So that goes on the invoices or it could go into the CSR or ESG reports. And they, your customer could then mix it with certified material in, in further processing, or it can be a standalone background claim. So that is the two paths so the two claims going through the supply chain. Now we're going to focus on this uh, Miss Ari, who's already certified, and she's 
gone down the supply chain very fast. And um, th this is the typical supply chain um, without the control source. And so these are the customers that, that are looking for certification. So there is companies in here that have already met their goal. They want 100% certified material by 2020. And there these, and there's other companies that are continuing to have very strong policies to say that we, we need to have certification. So when big companies like PepsiCo say that they need certified material, then their suppliers and maybe two or three tiers down the supply chain need to get certified. So that's the brands like Unilever that are looking for 100% certification. However, certification is quite new in rubber. And so we see the value of using the controlled source claim. And you can see where the using, having a certified processor, they use the chain of custody to implement the due diligence. And this is very similar to the, the what um, City mentioned about uh, the European Union's deforestation regulation. It's done in a due diligence system approach. So we already have a very strong due diligence system. It's Annex 1 of our chain of custody standard. And that enables uh, organizations to be able to deliver a product without the PFC logo, but with the assurance that it has met the core sustainability requirements. I'm gonna tell you more about that, but the example we have here is from the 3M, the Scotch tape, I'm sure we all know. Um, they are, putting in their business to business communication that they have control source as their eco label. And so this enables them to be able to show their customers or to be able to show the governments that their, their supply has, is covered by a, a internationally recognized certification system. So what does that mean? So the, the control sourcing is the implementation of the due diligence system. And the due diligence system is, a, is one of the pathways for meeting the sustainable development goals. Next thing. Here we have the definition of controversial sources. So this is what I would call the core sustainability requirement. So PFC does not allow any wood to go into a PFC certified supply chain unless there is negligible risk of these controlled source elements. You can see A to I. Some are quite um, contentious, it's like, um, uh, conflict timber. We've had to take all of the Russian wood out of the market because they do not meet the definition of non-controversial. And so this is um, this is the list of elements that need to be checked when you buy from your supplier. If you're buying from a farmer, or if you're buying from a factory, then you need to be sure that the, the product is not a, coming from a controversial source. So how is that done? What we, how it's done is through the, the, the flow chart at the top, that are the five um, process elements of controversial sources is first, we have to be able to get access to information to the from of the farmer or the, the, the forest owner. We need to 
do a risk assessment of them against the controversial sources that I just told you about in the previous slide. And then there needs to be a mechanism for you as a certified entity to deal with substantiated concerns. So for example, if you're buying wood from Myanmar, there may be substantiated concerns on some of your suppliers. If there is either um, risk that is non-negligible or there's substantiated concerns, you need to do management of the significant risk suppliers. So you might need to go and collect additional information to do on-site audits, to improve the practices of your suppliers. Otherwise, you cannot place it on the market. So the PFC chain of custody standards of 2020, they now have a very clear uh, door that they've shut that you, you can not, not, you cannot be a PFC certified company and have some of your wood as certified while other wood is not checked for legality and so that's the process of how you can deliver controlled sources. And you have to look at the X and Y axis. So you, 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 you crawl be, be, before you, you stand up or you, and you first look at where does it come from? What country? Is it a negligible risk or a significant risk country? So that's in table one of our Annex one in our standard. And that's like a, a green light that can give you the, the go ahead to say, okay, at an origin level, we know that, that this is negligible risk. So for example, it might come from um, a, another certification system like uh, Indonesian Flag T and that, that enables you to call it negligible risk. And so th then we look further at the origin level and these are red lights. These are where table two will come up with a, uh, is, a, is a list of things that you should check. And if any of those are present, for example, is there a war in the country at the moment? Then you shall assess that as significant risk and you shall, um, um, you should manage those significant risk suppliers. And so then the table three covers the supply chain level. So that is which countries have it come through or which factories have it come through. So this is um, the elements of controversial sources. And this is a tool that's available by using our chain of custody. Next thing. Um, so now we're on to the webinar as we go between our two case studies, I believe, um, because we'd be interested to know, and I'm, I'm betting that the majority of you source from Southeast Asia, and I'm guessing that because I believe around 90% of all the rubber in the world is planted in Southeast Asia. Uh, Africa is, is, is growing fast in countries like Ivory Coast. But as you, you've said, and I think we can close that poll, and it's got, I think, the, basically the, the numbers are, are right. The Southeast Asia, I think, has a, around 10 million hectares, um, whereas Africa and China, they are probably with the hundreds of thousands of hectares. Um, and so that would be um, why you, you source your, your rubber products. So by knowing where you source and by a PFC being present in Southeast Asia, then we are available to support you to um, be able to deliver certified and controlled source materials. So now we might move on to the next part of our presentation. And I will introduce you to 
Sean Go, who is a Singaporean born, American raised uh, colleague who's based in Bangkok. And he has been helping with market engagement and building partnerships. And he will explain how our team and different actors can work together to be able to best use the PFC framework. Please go ahead, Sean. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, my name is Sean. <clears throat> yeah, as Richard mentioned, uh, I'm born Singaporean, but lived in New York for the past 20 plus over years and recently had a great chance to come back to Southeast Asia. Um, and when I joined PFC, um, it was a real eye opener to really understand um, the challenges within the smallholder industry. And I'm so glad to be able to be part of this mission. Um, and engaging with the commercial sector is definitely um, a challenge because currently right now, I think the industry is really changing and growing and evolving, um, especially after post-COVID where um, global supply chains are um, busy trying to get back up to efficiency. And I think that if we look at the entire value chain, there's a lot of work to do. And um, I'm thankful to be part of this mission. And part of my journey um, with PEFC to help natural rubber stakeholders advance towards sustainability, um, we've seen many, many different efforts, um, different programs, different corporates who are trying a lot to help support and advance the smallholders. And one in particular that um, we're collaborating with really jumped out because um, I think one of the questions was about the burden and the cost about the smallholders. Um, the smallholders are definitely the underprivileged and also um, most at risk. And they're extremely vulnerable at these times as the market conditions become more complex and global supply are growing from Africa and Latin America. And as Richard mentioned, currently, there's a lot of supply that's coming in from Southeast Asia, but as globalization continues to evolve and supply chains also needs to be agile to adopt and adjust, um, a big uh, contribution that um, we've been uh, working with closely in collaboration with the Tochu's Project Tree, uh, aligned with the SDGs, um, we really, really think that uh, we would like to um, work more closely with them to better understand the key impacts because it takes a lot of resources and it takes a lot of time and effort to advance them, especially in countries like Indonesia where um, there's a lot of challenges within the, just the geographical context itself. So PFC commends Project Tree for implementing, um, sorry, implementing shared values with the UN SDGs and embracing this um, great role model. Would love to encourage more corporates and more stakeholders to participate and help collaborate with us to help advance the smallholder community. And so far, um, on behalf of um, the project tree, this is the current impacts that they have contributed to the Indonesian smallholders. And this scale, I'm oh, sorry, this graph doesn't didn't come from just you know a few months worth of work. It's uh, many many iterations, and we can see all the impact points from how many plantations were uh, it's under uh, managed by the smallholders. And if we look at the numbers, there's more than 5,000 uh, smallholders that are being trained by this program. And within the plantations of the smallholders, there's over 7,000. So we can see that the smallholders are actually overlooking very, very small areas. And one thing that really jumped out at me was that the access to technology and access um, to different tools and mechanisms. If we look at the app registration, a very simple tool such as a mobile phone or you know 3G network um, that we take for granted is something that's not easily accessible to the smallholders. So we look for I look forward to working with more partners to help support the local um, smallholder community in Southeast Asia. And we really hope that um, our hard work and efforts here uh, within the ASEAN community can prove a prototype uh, working model for the other countries. Uh, sorry, the other continents in Latin America and Africa. Um, another great example, um, we understand that, well, I understand that, you know, contributing all of these uh, resources to developing the smallholders um, 
requires you know, some sort of a reporting measure and also some key benefits, right? Otherwise, um, it's in a way, it's in a way would be more fruitful if we could create win-win situations. And here is a great example so from Seki Sui, Shi House, Seki Sui House that has attained um, PFC certification with our NGB member in Japan, SJEC. And uh, for under the ESG reporting, they have actually recognized, uh, CDP has actually recognized PFC for, uh, for certification scheme as a contributing scoring methodology. And in this instance, it actually helped them get a double A rating. Now, if we look at on the other side, um, with regards to the Western hemisphere, IFRS is currently consolidating a lot of the global standards uh, under the framework of IFRS uh, with the US and UK, and PEFC has also been recognized as well. So I'm glad to say that like PEFC's framework is globally recognized, not only from a supply chain um, compliance point of view, but also from an ESG point of view, it actually contributes a lot. Now, moving on to the next, web, uh, next poll, Here's a question that I think a lot of um, stakeholders this year have been um, being engaged. Um, is, uh, are you strategically prepared for EUDR? And there's a lot of um, information that's out in the market right now. PFC is definitely ready to help support um, companies who are interested in working with us. And one of the big things I think that I've learned from post-COVID supply chain strategy is risk diversification. And this is a very, very big challenge that as the global economy rise, com <laughs> competing with the different variables of inflation and all the other variables that come into play, risk diversification is the first thing that jumps out to any sort of management and strategic plan. And uh, I think we can close this poll to see um, a quick snapshot of uh, how our current participants are readiness for, okay. Yes, um, one of the questions from popped up that says, can, uh, yes, we'll definitely send the slides to all their uh, participants. And also there's a lot of great questions that came up, but unfortunately we'll try to answer some. And um, SJEC, uh, our uh, member in Japan will also translate all of these questions um, and send it back all to our audiences. Um, with that said, um, thank you very much for participating. I'm gonna hand over to the last case study uh, in Thailand, Mr. Uh, Akirind from the Board Committee of Thailand Forest Certification Council. Hi, John. Hi, Richard. And um, good afternoon to all participants. Um, thank you for having me today. Uh, PFC have provided me an opportunity for speaking today on behalf of Thailand for Waste Certification Council. My name is Akarin Wong um, I am a board member of uh, TFCC. Uh, TFCC is the organization under the Federation of Thai Industry, or FTI. FTI is a national governing body or NGB of PEFC in Thailand. So we are the organization that uh, represent PEFC in Thailand. Um, additionally, myself, I also serve as the chairman of uh, Wood Processing Cup at the uh, Federation of Thai Industry as well. Okay, today uh, I'm going to show you how Thailand is advancing towards sustainability in the rubber wood sector to certification. So, uh, all right, so let's start with the number. So. As you know, Thailand, we are the biggest uh, manufacturer of rubber wood products in the world. Also, we are one of the largest uh, country to have a rubber tree plantation area in the world. Um, we have about 4 million hectares uh, right now throughout every part of Thailand, but the main dense area is in the southern part of Thailand and in the eastern part of Thailand. So come back to the certification. Of course, um, certification is the new issue, but 
I strongly believe that it will play the very important roles for the industry development in the very near future with the climate change crisis, uh, with the uh, carbon uh, trading market, and with all the issues that we have in the world right now. So currently Thailand, we have about 1,000 hectares of property plantation already PFC certified. Uh, it seems that it's still less, but uh, we have some more in the pipeline uh, from the private sectors, from the small holders who uh, group as the cooperative. Uh, also, we also have the, some more in the pipeline with the support from the government, like the rubber authority of Thailand. So right now with that 1000 hectares of uh, rubber plantation, it can be converted to about 200,000 tons of uh, rubber wood products in our forms. I mean, we combined with all the blocks, the slab, the sawdust that can make all the product throughout the supply chain. So for the COC right now, we have four, four, four companies that are uh, uh, in the PFC COC certification. So right now we can say that in Thailand, we have uh, uh, complete all the supply chain for uh, rubber wood for the starting steps. So we are ready for the market. Okay, next please. All right, so yeah, as I mentioned, we have uh, four companies for the COC right now. So let's start that, uh, who are there? Uh, the first one is uh, my company, BNS Wood Industry. So we produce um, uh, for the upstream and middle streams. Uh, we have KD on timber, we have wood pellets, chips, and slab. The next one is the Sun Trade para wood. Um, this company is a sawmill, so they can produce on timber and the slab, also the sawdust. Uh, the third one is the Asia Biomass a Public Company Limited, or we call them ABM in the Thai stock market. So they are both manufacturing, uh, manufacturer and the trading companies for all the fuels, uh, wooden fuel products. And the last one is uh, Sansui that they do PFC control source. This is one of the biggest uh, wood pellet manufacturer in Thailand. So yeah, this is all about the upstreams and the medium stream for the fuel. Uh, so in Japan, as uh, there is a lot of uh, requirement for wood pellets for the biomass power plant. So this is the very important steps that right now Thailand, we can offer 100% certified EFC certified rubber wood pellets for Japanese market. Although as you see, the volume may seem small today, but with all the projects in the pipeline in the futures and with all the pressure from the market, uh, I am very confident that we will have more and more supply for certified PFC pellets for Japanese power generation in the very near future. Next, please. All right, so apart from uh, upstream and middle, uh, um, uh, middle streams, we also have the downstreams for that, that uh, my company produce. So we have a wooden floor, uh, spot flooring, and like finger joy board. So I will go talk about this uh, as this is uh, um, uh, the private company. Also, so this is what we want to show that in Thailand right now, the supply chains has been complete from the plantation, from the harvesting, from the sawmill, uh, keep and dry until that the byproduct from the sawmill make the wood chips and wood pellets for boiler for uh, power generation. And then um, all the middle stream product like timber for uh, furniture factory also ready. And then all the finished product also ready. So Thailand, we are ready to take off for the bright future of a PFC certified rubber product. So if you are interested in a more rubber wood 
certified products. So the FCC Thailand for Web Certification Council uh, would be happy to answer all of your questions and update the status and what news that we have. So this is the uh, this is the email on the on 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 the below chart. So apart from apart from wood product, uh, uh, TFCC and the Thai government also support for the natural rubber. Uh, as uh, we believe that uh, natural rubber is a uh, uh, very important industry for Thai economy. So yeah, for the, we we have more and more uh, FM source and the natural rubber factory join COC in the very near future too. So yeah, thank you very much. This is uh, for Thailand update for now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Kun Um There's just one very, uh, there's a couple of questions that came up uh, when, and this happened when you were talking about um, the certified natural rubber plantation and the, and the uh, co-ops. So I think um, one thing to keep in mind is that there is a cost to our certification, regardless of the subsidies. Costs and resources, not as only just money, but also time and training. And in Thailand, it's um, it's it's so great to, that to see the system as uh, Mr. Akarin mentioned just now, the rubber authority of Thailand. And we want to ensure that um, we don't overburden the smallholders too much, too fast, too quickly. And we're trying to time the market based on supply and demand. So this way, we understand the allocation and the availability. As uh, Mr. Akarin mentioned, um, the country is ready to engage uh, with certified um, supply chains. And all we need to do is to be able to understand the volumes and the commitments um, the, that the commercial stakeholders require. And from this methodology, we'll be able to unlock um, the availability of um, certified forests. So what we've seen so far, the 1000 hectares is a prototype model where all the smallholders can come and see what sustainable forest management pra best practices is so that they can learn and be prepared. Um, yeah, I just wanted to cover that because there were some really, really good questions uh, that came out from the, the Q&A. Um, to go into deep specifics on this one, I think it's better to, to do it in writing. Um, thank you very much for your questions and the references of the documentations like ILO and all of this. I think we will follow up with um, a written response. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Akarin. Now I uh, would like to bring it back to uh, Richard. Sorry, um, Mr. Akarin, would you like to add on to anything that I've mentioned? Um, yes, so thank you for uh, uh, add up on uh, what the situation in Thailand. So as you know, most of the plantation here uh, belongs to uh, smallholders. So to be honest, it is impossible to each farmer to certify themselves. So with the new idea, with the new concept of like group certification, cooperative, or even control source, together with the fully support from the government, like the Robert Authority of Thailand, so that's what we can see that in the future, we will obviously, obviously have some more and more uh, FM source to serve both the uh, natural rubber and timber industries in Thailand for export throughout the world. Thank you, Mr. Akio. Okay, I think we're moving on to the last section um, where we'll try to grab some Q&A and uh, I'll pass the mic back to Richard. Okay, um, so I did see some great questions there and I did try to answer a few in, in writing. Um, I, I will, um, talk about some um, in, in, in a little bit more because they're, they're quite large, large subjects. So the PFC SFM certification includes deforestation. How does it fit in UDR? Uh, I know City is an expert in this. I'm not sure if City would, would like to cover this with a Q 
case study from, from Malaysia. But PFC has its cutoff date in its SFM standard of 2010. So that's 10 years prior to the EU deforestation regulation. And PFC also has a continuous uh, review of our, our system. And so when we get the European Union's implementation guidelines of the EUDR, we'll be able to see exactly what do they mean by deforestation and the definitions of, um, of such um, conversion for very unique circumstances that may occur, um, but this has not yet been um, clearly defined. And we, we have led the way to um, talk about deforestation can only be done in very, um, a very small amount of justifiable circumstances. Um, and, and this will need to be, um, this sort of issue will need to be address, addressed by the EUDR. We, we've had 20 years of experience of discussing this. I'm not sure if, um, if anyone would like to um, share more about that um, city yeah. or? Yeah, well, Richard, since you mentioned my name, I just, well, basically we're talking about deforestation in, in the context of the SFM, the Sustainable Forest Management Standard under the PFC um, SFM standard. There's basically a cutoff date that um, prevents or prohibited conversion of uh, natural forest areas or even forest plantation areas into other land use. So whatever forest or forest plantation that we have has to be maintained as forest areas. So in a way, um, uh, our cutoff date currently is the 31st December 2010, which is 10 years earlier than the UDR uh, cutoff date of 2020. So basically, when you talk about conversion, um, a certification will not, um, areas that are converted or deforested before or after the cutoff date of 31st December 2010 is not eligible for certification. Um, in, in that sense, um, for certified areas, you can be quite, um, you can be quite, what do you call that? Um, uh, pardon me, I've got kids coming into the room. Sorry, so, um, so certification uh, requirements would uh, uh, make it uh, ineligible for areas that are, that are converted to be certified. So those areas um, in a way is protected or uh, there's no deforestation happening in uh, currently uh, certified forest areas. There are some issues about um, uh, certification not being able to prevent deforestation, which is true in a way. Um, when we talk about deforestation, it goes back to who owns the forest. And 80% um, almost forest areas globally is owned by the state. And the state also has their, you know, um, um, responsibility or also that have their own socio-economic uh, uh, development focus. So if the state decides to deforest some of these areas, there's nothing certification can do to prevent that. But what we can basically uh, confirm is that areas that are converted, um, especially forest plantation that are converted after the cut of date cannot be certified. So that's the, um, what do you call that, um, protection clause. Um, against uh, deforestation that we have in our standard. I hope that's uh, clear and not too uh, confusing. Okay. No, I, I think it's, it's a, a um, hot topic and one that obviously is at the, the forethought of the EU um, and, 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 and um, cities experience of certification being trying to address deforestation is is a, a challenging one because I think uh, around 80% of the deforestation that occurs globally is for agricultural production, not for forest production. So yes, thanks for that answer, Siti. Um, so, Richard, there's um, yes. there's 
question here about controlled source certification. And I think like, it's great that we touch on the SFM part, but maybe perhaps yeah. we could do a little bit uh, of this, the importance okay. of commercial stakeholder by having a COC certificate. This actually helps understand the volumes that is needed from the SFM from the smallholder community, which constitutes yes. the controlled source. So I think um, perhaps maybe we can give like uh, a, a quick start point. So example, like, you know, if a company yeah. or if an organization already has ISO 9000 and I ISO 1400, mm -hmm. uh, the necessary um, um, documentation and policies and work that have already been done um, contributes yes. to getting the COC, right? Sorry. Um, yes. So yeah, that you partly answered. So the, um, Mr. Gum, or uh, sorry, I, I assume you're a man. I'm sorry, but uh, good, a good question about the uh, elaborate more on PFC controlled source certification. So what are the activities, preparation of the company, etc. So the, the first thing is you need to know the origin and the supply chain of your material, and you need to be able to show that that is non-controversial. And so you would um, have a, a management system in place that is like a stock control system. M many companies would find it not too difficult um, to have a, it's, it's basically a stock control system um, and that ensures that the um, product that is in the controlled source claim cannot be mixed with any uncertified material. So that's the activities the company would need to prepare. And the company would also need to engage a certification body. And then you would um, uh, probably get quotations from three different certification bodies. And they would then give you a competitive um, quote for um, checking the, the scope. Of, of your certificate. You might have one factory or you could have 10 factories in five different countries. Um, and the, the certification body would then come and audit you and audit a sample of your suppliers that you have put through your due diligence system and, and claim controlled sources. Um, Sometimes the companies, as you said, um, Sean, have ISO 9000 or 14000, and maybe they're members of GPSNR and they have policies for, for a range of things, um, such as, as uh, you know, human rights and, and um, deforestation. Um, and so you, the company may be be able to make their management system themselves, or you might use consultants that could develop the system and that consultant can, can prepare those. And so um, depending on how complex your supply chain is, um, it, it, it would take uh, somewhere between six, <laughs> six weeks and I would, say uh, six months if you can get certified, if you, if you allocated um, uh, enough resources. Uh, if you already have a sustainability team, you already have um, some uh, stock control and you are a, a company that, that is aware of, of the certification um, process, plan, do, check, react, um, um, in, in, in embedded into all of your um, uh, activities, um, then that, that's how you would be prepared for, for controlled sources. And so, so yeah. I think like for the rubber, the rubber stakeholders, um, this is quite new to them on, on, on forest, uh, forestry standards in the rubber sector. So I think there was a comment there about like certified timber, but no certified latex. That is not true. So maybe perhaps you could explain a little bit about um, non timber forestry product and how um, it's somewhat similar to actually uh, the rubber uh, materials that come out from uh, SFM plantations. 
yeah, so we we call it controlled source. It's not controlled wood. We so it can work with non-timber forest products such as as um, rubber, or it could be an oil from a from a from a pine tree, or a range of different um, uh, non-timber forest products, and and we. Um, so, so that, that's how the, the controlled source works, um, and it's you can choose to certify your plantation just for the natural rubber, or for the rubber wood and the natural rubber. Um, it, it depends on what the market is is demanding and what is the, the main business, and also where the, the risks are. And, I know quite a lot of plantations, they got certified for rubber wood in the last 15 years. Um, but now that the rubber is included in very significant regulations like the UBR, we're seeing that more people are interested in, in the existing um, uh, certification systems. And, and, I, and I did hear, see a question about, um, our participation in GPSNR. Uh, GPSNR, we are a founding member and we have voiced um, a, a strong um, perspective on the importance of including um, smallholders and their associations and working closely with the government so that the, the sort of the assurance system they develop is is one that is scalable, um, and 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 is credible. Uh, so we 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 worked hard there, um, and we will continue to be representing the interests of our members. And in Southeast Asia, our members are, are, are those that have a lot of rubber production. Um, I would also like to maybe answer a question from Chong Pu Pang um, about the burden and the cost to add to smallholders um, who are un usually uneducated. So the, that's a very good question, and it's something that I am very aware of. I, I think that certification can be done in the wrong and the right way. I think that um, if you are doing um, forest management certification, you should do it at a scale that is large enough that the cost and burden is very small. Otherwise, they will be asking for a very high price premium. And this doesn't get the farmers out of poverty or they'll keep the farmers rich and it doesn't keep the company's um, cost down. So I'm thinking 4,000 hectares is a good size for a, a group certificate. That would be where you would you would not add too much burden and cost. Um, and as you mentioned, they're uneducated. But in most of these countries, there are very good research institutes that have been around for decades, if not more than a century, maybe in some countries, uh, that can uh, bring actors together to make a group certification that can take that burden off the poorest and most vulnerable people in the supply chain. Um, yes, um, I, I would just like to uh, Takishi Arisono. I see you've written six questions there and I think I will just try to answer them very briefly uh, to stimulate any more questions. Uh, we, we do have 10 more minutes left. So a, a tree disease, PFC will allow pesticides and, and other interventions as long as they're in line with the World Health Organization's guideline. We don't have our own list of chemicals that are banned like some other certification system. We, we respect the international bodies on their um, guidance. So that's quick answer one. 
Question number two, the location of latex production needs to be traced back. Yes, it needs to be able to be traced back. So there needs to be some, um, some uh, way of, it could be the contract with the harvester or it could be the, the information from the owner or, or it could be the, um, the, the geolocation from, from the satellite. But yes, there's often needs to be some ability to trace back the um, product. And that can be very difficult. Uh, maybe uh, Akarin, maybe you have a comment about tracing the wood back to the, the farmers, but um, I know Akarin has um, a sawmill where he is planning to buy wood from the, from the small holders. And he works with, he, the cooperative has a certificate. And so the location of the latex production, it, it might, the information might, might be held at the cooperative level. And, um, and then you can know where does it come from based on the member of the cooperative. Question number three, which document should be reviewed for evidence of verifying later collection? I think um, the, the documents would be things like training records um, on uh, internal audits um, and uh, uh, other, other ways where you can, if you can see that the process is, is in place on the ground in practice, then you can document it with a with a photo, <laughs> um, and that's that's a a, a, a practical way. Um, there's a, some good apps on the phone that can can do this, and um, yes, it, the location of these old latex collections uh, could be used by checking those documents if the documents are found to be complete and um, consistent with, with the, um, the, the, the stock that you've got in, in the scope of your, your um, due diligence system. And then the last question about what documents to review the insurance via local labor requirements. So I mentioned those documents like you, like you saw. Also, um, there can be policies from the, the company or there could be um, uh, members that, uh, uh, sorry, there could be um, yeah, members in unions or there could be trainings done by third parties. And so there's six questions answered. Could someone else help me to um, um, choose a question that you would like me to answer next? I, um, Am, am available. So for Puma, which company is a PFC auditor in Laos? So uh, for, for chain of custody, the, the one that is being done at the moment is, is from France, is Bureau of Veritas. However, the company that does the natural forest certification uh, preferred by nature, they can do PFC auditing as well as uh, the, the the certification body GFA that does the certification of the plantations um, for for a few companies that I know in Laos, and so um, yeah. Would anyone else like to ask a question, uh, or maybe you would like to uh, voice a question? Maybe you could put your your hand up. Um, so, yeah, I've got, I, I do see some questions in, in the, um, in the chat. Um, I think one, like, one useful yes. thing here, Richard, um, is because I feel like we have members within the rubber association, uh, associations. Um, globally as well. Um, I think we haven't touched on this topic, but um, we do have group certification models for COC as well that can be done mm -hmm. on 
association level. And uh, this, the reason why I bring this up is because um, we are trying to, our goal is to be enable market access for smallholders. And by having more stakeholders engaged in a supply chain, this helps what Richard mentioned about price parity, because the smaller the land area, the higher the cost, the higher the price that comes out. And that's not what our intentions are to be able to keep a, a very high, a high price point. Um, so I think like how we can try to reach price parity is to be able to um, help as many stakeholders who are interested in collaborating with us to engage in group certification because this strategy has worked um, indefinitely within the small holders. And I think like um, we should, uh, maybe Richard can share a little bit on the association level, how can group uh, certification work? Because on a multinational corporation is straightforward uh, in terms of reporting, but from an association level, uh, I think this would also contribute a lot of value as well. Yeah, so I think this the, with the association, there's two main ways that you could support your members to get certified. One is the association itself could get certified and then you would have a group chain of custody and you could then have your different private, different privately owned companies become a group of the association's certification membership. Um, there is some limits about uh, maximum 50 full-time employees and maximum turnover of 10 million euros to be considered for a group chain of custody. So the, the first way is the association could hold a, a, a certificate and then you could, so maybe it costs $5,000 for the consultant and the first audit. If you share that across 10 people, maybe then you can, um, you can reduce the cost of certification. I know in some countries, it's, it's as low as $100 per company in countries that they've been doing this for many, many years, like in Italy and Germany. Um, <laughs> And the second, the second way that an association can support certification of its members is by providing the tools. So providing the templates for the management systems, providing um, some shared risk assessment uh, processes, working with the government or the, um, the growers association to provide the data so that you can easily put the control source claim there without having to collect a lot of additional information. So that there's a, a couple of ways where a association can support their members. Um, the, there's a very good model in England where the Timber Importers Association, they run their own due diligence system. It works for all types of certification uh, and they, um, they help big companies and small companies and the small companies join as a member of the COC group and the big companies just use the tools available from the association. So that's how we can work together as a, as a group COC. Thank you, Richard. And I think um, Siddi would like to, uh, Siddi would um, just open her mic just now and we're at the 3.30 mark already. <laughs> and we know that well, it's uh, 5.30ish, six uh, in, in Japan. So um, Siddi, maybe uh, you have, um, some final comments, and then we'll leave uh, some, uh, we'll share with the uh, participants upcoming uh, seminars in Chinese. Yeah, no, well, basically, I just wanted to add on the, 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 the question that was asked regarding the um, organization of the smallholders. So it's really up uh, to the group how they want to organize themselves. It could be supported by the government. It could be supported by the uh, regional authorities. It could be done in many ways. And there's a standard for the group certification, basically, basically to pull together all the resources and it can be fully supported by the government, it can be done. So, um, and, and Richard has mentioned that and, and provided some example where it's done in, in, the, in the European context. 
Um, so a number of forest areas certified in Europe are actually through group certification with a large number of smallholders uh, coming together and form a group and get the, the, the large area certified. So, um, and um, I think before um, we end, I would just like to thank you for the participation, a very active participation. We, hit, we hope we have managed to answer most of your questions. There are some questions about um, the difference between RSPO and, and PFC and whether it is accepted in the market. Um, you might know that there's this group called the Global Sustainable Rubber, um, GPSNR. And um, there's a number of um, companies asking for certified um, rubber and latex. What's the difference is that um, PFC covers forest, all types of forest areas. And um, rubber is also rubber is a, is a tree from the forest. And, um, and latex is considered um, non-timber forest products. So it basically fits very well um, in our uh, study and it can be done. And, and um, um, iris bill is for all palm. And um, basically in, in when talking about the acceptance, I think Richard has also mentioned in his slide um, with all the different recognition and acceptance of the brand in the market. So um, there's a lot of requirement, requirement for it. There's a lot of request for certified rubber as well. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to support all the players. How can we uh, meet the demand in the market in a way that you know, will be beneficial for all of us? Um, and to come back to what I mentioned in my first welcoming remarks with regard to our commitment um, in achieving SDGs. So these are all the, the different um, players and the different tools that need to work together, you know, to promote sustainable, um, natural biobase products um, rather than, you know, fuel base or rather than an unsustainable um, um, product. Um, so we want to create the alternative and, and responsible way of, of um, producing um, such products. So I pass it back to uh, Sean to close and thank you very much. Well, thank you everyone Thanks. for, for, for um, participating. Um, there's, uh, sorry, Richard, uh, go ahead. No, I was just, I was just going to say that um, we have seen a lot of questions for the for the presentation. Um, we we will also have a small, I believe, a small quiz. Uh, 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 sorry, some feedback, and so we 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 should have your contact details. Uh, if we don't already have them, please put them in in the the closing um, poll, um, and. Sean, or shall I go through the next? Um, yeah, so it, actually, this is just some um, some um, training that's coming up in the next um, few weeks where we're focusing on China. This I, I, this um, present webinar has really focused on on Japan, um, but on the fifth of May, I, I would encourage you to ask your if you have colleagues and. China to come and learn a, a, in a, a two hour presentation that will be done in, in, in Mandarin. Um, and then we'll also be doing an order for training uh, the week after that. Um, and this will be done in Mandarin as well. So there'll be, be more Chinese certification bodies and auditors available. Um, and, and there, there's actually an English uh, training at the same time being run from Switzerland. So uh, we have lots of trainings coming up and we, we plan to have these webinars uh, periodically to, to continue our supporting sustainable rubber. We, 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 we've now got, the, we've now got the, the best quality and, and I think big enough quantity um, and companies that are committed to provide the continuity for, for sustainable rubber. So we hope that you can put that in your business model and we can embark in a, in a partnership. I, I, one question was, what can we do apart from just controlled sources? Is we, can also, we can also support in your marketing, communication and advocacy. If, people, if your team needs additional training, we'd be very happy to 
use our network of local officers that can train you in the, the, the local language. And we can um, um, also link up um, markets. So if you are looking and you can't find, or if you're, or if you're uh, uh, then maybe we can help you. So we have this team uh, like Sean, who's very active in market engagement and, and doing these uh, um, uh, market links and, and getting new sectors to understand about the, um, the certification and certifications role in, in, in uh, meeting buyers uh, requirements. Um, and, and then also we have a, a good team of, of foresters and, and experts that can help to develop the systems on the ground. And, and, and I can, like Sidi said, uh, is in a country like Finland, they only have five certificates and they have 11 million hectares certified, uh, producing 95 million cubic meters. And 95% of it is certified. So there, there is a possibility to do this in large scale where the cost is almost negligible. Um, and we, we know that it's very different between um, Finland and um, Thailand or Indonesia. However, we have got, we can use our, our alliance in PFC um, and learn from each other to, to develop solutions that work for, for your um, production system. So thank you very much. And, and please, please spend 10 seconds um, to, to do a survey when you leave because you can invite